but I'd much rather have you on the TV explaining it and saying, look, these are the quantitative effects. These are the benefits. This is where we can get the most bang for our buck. These are the things that everyone will support. Let's do it. Then hear the sort of catastrophizing and, you know, we're all going to be dead in 12 years. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Welcome to another Bad Boy Meets. Today, we have another superb special guest, Professor Thomas Crowther. Thank you very much for joining us on the channel. Yeah, thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you for uh, taking the time. So, uh, Professor Crowther is a British scientist specializing in ecosystem ecology and the chief scientific advisor on the UN's Trillion Tree Campaign. He's produced research that's been featured in Nature, and contributed to the research base for the uh, famous UN IPCC reports on climate change, um, providing essential data to the relevant models. He's a tenure track professor of global uh, ecosystem ecology at ETH Zurich, where he formed the Crowther Lab. His work aims to generate holistic understanding of the global scale ecological systems which regulate the Earth's climate. And the lab is dedicated to mapping the distributions of plants and soil organisms that quantify the amount of carbon um, they exchange worldwide. So improving inputs to climate models, better predictions for the impacts of human activities on the climate, better understanding how we can have the most efficient um, uh, attempts to restore ecosystems and fight against climate change. So first question as we kind of go through this, um, I had a chat with uh, a former colleague of mine, Hamish Gordon at, um, at CERN, and he works on particulates and their impact on these climate models. How quantitative, because obviously I'm poisoned by physics and working at CERN really high precision, how um, quantitative is the field of um, ecosystems ecology? That's a good question now. So I'm sorry, this, it, is a, this is a physics versus biology. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> loving it. That's a good, good way to start. Let's get straight into the nitty gritty. Um, no, it's a very good question because I think we'd argue that it's always been quantitative, but I'd, I'd say ecosystem ecology or ecology in general has always been focused on the mechanism. We find cool things about how this species interacts with this species to maybe shape the functioning of a system. But I'd say it's until very recently completely lacked that quantitative element. We, so we find these cool mechanisms, but we don't understand how they scale or how they vary across the globe. Yeah. And it's only really recently in the light of, you know, developments with satellite technology, but also global quantitative data and, and remote sensing approaches that we're able to combine all of those observations and start to get really quantitative. So I think it's 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 becoming a, a truly quantitative field and i guess that's one of the one of the focuses of of your lab is to get more into that that quantitative side of it and most importantly which is what i really liked aim to find scientific solutions to climate change and biodiversity loss so we're talking about actual solutions rather than a lot of what we see which is sort of catastrophizing let's let's actually do something about it so that's good to my science-based mind my cost benefit analysis sort of mind <laughs> um practical ways assess the cost assess the benefits and then we can hopefully uh, find some solutions that will get some broad-based consensus and support. So first uh, big question that I had planned, and and I'm sorry if this comes off as quite uh, tart. Um, why should we care? So there's a lot of people who focus on the technological fields that contribute to climate change, you know, flying, we've got flight shaming is a very big thing in the news at the moment, uh, cars, industry, um, but there's actually lots of ecologists who are involved in this climate change work. So I'm here in Leeds. Uh, there's Julia Steinberger here, who's who's very vocal on it. She goes down and gets involved in the Extinction Rebellion marches and stuff. So we'll leave that to one side. But why should we care? How big are these natural carbon exchanges when we compare them to the the impacts that we think of more with climate change, the cars, the industry, the uh, the burning of fossil fuels? I mean, simply put, because the impact is is relevant at any scale you want to talk about it. So we've, until now, you know, 
the idea of planting trees and sucking carbon out of the atmosphere is certainly not a new one. Yeah. We've all we've known they do photosynthesis forever, and we've known they they store a lot of carbon, but it's never been a quantitative and tangible solution. Mm. It's always been the happy clappy one. Yeah. Uh, because we've never had that quantitative idea about what's physically possible. Um, but it's, as I say, in light of these new technologies, remote sensing, machine learning, and all the massive ground source data sets that we've got, we can place that all into a real context. And we see that there's, if we restore ecosystems across the globe, we're not just able to store the odd ton of carbon here or there. We're literally talking gigatons of carbon mm. and hundreds of gigatons of carbon in the soil and in vegetation, which places it at least amongst all of the other climate change solutions that n require our sort of time and investment. And the other value, the other benefit is that these are the natural solutions. Yeah. So they're not just, uh, you know, contributing to climate change discussions, but they're also addressing the threats of biodiversity loss and, you know, social, social well-being across the world. Yeah. Half of the world's population still relies on forest products mm. for their livelihoods. And, and restoring those forests in a healthy way is going to be valuable just for those human well-being uh, perspectives. So I think, I think certainly this is, it's, it's exciting that people are finally starting to take this seriously. Well, I, I, didn't, I honestly didn't realise it was on a par with those other efforts. And I think it's an area, as you say, there's a lot of other side benefits as well that you can sell. And also it's a field that I don't think you'll have a lot of fight back from people. You know, everyone wants a nice green area near their house to, to go and walk around in. It's, it's something that I think can easily get broad-based support. So what are we talking about the balance here? Are we talking about trees are taking up the carbon and then is it microorganisms respiring in the soil that are putting it back? What's the, what's the trade-off there? Because we see a lot of people on the sort of more climate denier side say, look, CO2 is plant food. You talked about photosynthesis. And they say, why should we bother? Put all the CO2 in. We'll just get more greening and a lot more growing of plants and that will offset. What's the, what's the balance that's going on there in terms of the, the competing factors in the science? Well, I mean, simply put, yeah, trees absorb carbon. And yeah, the microorganisms in the soil decompose that carbon and release a lot of it back into the atmosphere. And generally, until humans got into the mix, those processes were in flux. And I tell you, quite simply, those fluxes are both 10 times bigger than anthropogenic emissions. So, you know, we're emitting whatever, 10 gigatons a year. Yeah. These plants are, are absorbing and, and soils are emitting about 120 gigatons a year. Wow. But it's that balance that we're trying to maintain. So when you tip that balance, what we're doing at the moment is generally tipping the balance in favor of emissions. Yeah. As we warm the planet and dry the planet, carbon's lost from the soil, which is actually speed adding to the anthropogenic emissions. And when we you know, have increasing incidences of forest fires, but it is also true that plants do grow more when there's elevated CO2, but that is not even going to touch the sides of offsetting the anthropogenic emissions. So, we, you know, while natural ecosystems play a role in balancing this system, there's no way the increased plant growth alone is going to do it. So we need to help the systems a lot. And, and what we see is in most cases, uh, about we estimate almost a billion hectares around the world are degraded yeah. there's that's land that's been degraded by humans and and it's not able to regenerate yeah. itself so with some facilitation with some 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 help or you know um facilitating the soil with it with inoculants of carbon or, or water or planting trees or restoring grasslands and wetlands we can start to build those ecosystems again from scratch. And when you build an ecosystem, you just lock in carbon. It's as simple as that. If you imagine a forest is a, or a tree is a bank, you know, at the beginning, you're putting in more carbon than, than is being released. And that means your, your bank account is growing. And, and by the end, after 100 years or so, that bank account is maxed out. It's, it's now taking in as much carbon as it's releasing. But the bank account is huge. There's a million dollars in it. And that's what we want to get to. We want to get to the state where ecosystems are storing their maximum amount of carbon. So this idea that, that CO2 is plant food, we don't need to worry. We've cut the knees out from that. So that's good. Yeah, um, exactly. I was looking at uh, one of the pieces of research that um, I, I believe when you were at the NIOO, we yeah. said that a one degree C increase in temperatures could release an, re release an additional 55 billion tonnes of soil carbon. That's 200 billion tonnes. Of carbon dioxide so as you say this fight between photosynthesis and the the microorganisms where we're tilting that in favor of releasing more carbon and that's going to have a, a terrible impact so this natural carbon cycle driven by organisms these plants and and microorganisms um, it's critical in regulating carbon and the temperature of the planet 
Um, what are the major contributors to that? You talked about the microorganisms. We're we talking bacteria, fungi. What are we What are we talking about there? I mean, honestly, we. It's hard to pass out the total contributions, but yeah, microorganisms do include bacteria, fungi. There's archaea in the soil that do a little bit. Uh, there's also protists and, and and soil animals that contribute a lot to that so that carbon flux from the soil. Um, so yeah, those are the major the major respire you know organisms respiring carbon into the atmosphere a along with plants. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously plants are primarily responsible for for taking photosynthesizing and taking all that carbon out of the atmosphere. So it's it's sort of the respiration of all those organisms balanced off by the uptake by plants. So what what are the the human alteration how are the human alterations to the ecosystems disrupting that balance so first order is it we're cutting down trees basically the trees are disappearing so those banks are going um but you also did some research that says that carbon's emitted from the soil at a faster rate as the temperature goes up why is that is that just the chemical reactions in these microorganisms going at a faster rate or they grow more or what's the, i mean the impact there? when when you warm things up their enzyme activity tends to increase and you know there's enzyme kinetic curves that you'll be very familiar with where you see increases yeah. in in enzyme activity up to about 20 or 30 degrees and most of the world is not currently at 20 or 30 degrees mm -hmm. so when you warm them they they become more active and if those are the organisms that are respiring carbon into the atmosphere you speed up that process and yeah. they'll respire more uh, and in particular we see that those changes are the biggest in the high latitude areas and these this is interesting because Cold conditions up in the Arctic over thousands of years has led to the accumulation of loads and loads and loads of carbon because the organisms up there are just really slow and they're not respiring much. But as we warm those ecosystems, ah. those microorganisms start to spew out carbon. And because all the soil carbon's up there, that's where you're seeing these massive acceleration of carbon into the atmosphere. I but I should stress, this is only one of the feedbacks that's taking place. There, as you mentioned earlier, there is still the, the, the biological feedback where plants are, the, the same unit area of plants are taking up more carbon. Mm. So if we could save and preserve the, carb, the plants that we've got there, they could help to offset some of those losses. But yeah, at the moment, we're cutting down trees, burning trees, removing ecosystems, and, and soils are emitting carbon. So it's, I believe it's going in that direction. And then there was this uh, second order effect that I'd never really heard about. And I'm not, I don't think I'm even going to attempt to pronounce some of these words, but the second order impact of, of fungi. So in May 2019, you co-authored some research on global, I'll have a go, mycorrhizal fungal <laughs> networks. So not only is it cutting down the trees, but there's also some sort of symbiotic relationship between other organisms that depend on the trees. What, what was the, the focus of that research? So the second order effects on top of these uh, these ideas of just removing the trees as well. Totally. That's it. So you when you remove the trees, obviously, you're losing a load of uh, a load of carbon from that system. I mean, not always. You could be turning it into rocking horses and houses that are trapping <laughs> carbon for ages. But we, we, we're, we're more uncertain about that. Normally, a lot of that carbon gets lost. But yeah, more. I would Crowd, say more the lab suggests turning everything into rocking horses. <laughs> yeah, all right. There's one of your solutions. <laughs> um, but more concerning than that is that that network of ecological interactions that gets altered or changed or, or, or destroyed. So not only do you lose thousands of the organisms that lock in that carbon into the ecosystem when, when you lose the trees, but under climate change, as yeah, as you say, as you mentioned, we're we're changing the composition of the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. And mm -hmm. and because some decompose more quickly than others some respire carbon into the atmosphere at a faster rate than others we when you change those communities you often get very big changes in in the amount of carbon stored in those ecosystems and what we see is we're tending in a lot of microbial systems to shift communities towards faster cycling communities yeah. which means then that they're also going to be emitting more carbon yeah so it's a, it's a slightly runaway effect of uh, the impact on these ecosystems so moving on slightly, another aspect of what you do is mapping these ecosystems, this ge geospatial mapping. Um, I was reading on, on Wikipedia about you that you were teased for years being called the tree counter, which sounded a bit like an end from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Sounds like orc mischief to me. Um, and you published some research in Nature that suggested there's approximately three trillion trees on the Earth. And quantified the scale of uh, the scale of human impact over time. That that's dropped by forty six percent 
since the onset of agriculture 12,000 years ago, with the, the previous estimates suggested there was only 400 billion trees on the earth. So why is your lab so interested in quantifying this number? And what are the quantitative details that are important when understanding ecosystems with respect to climate change? What are the, what are the big numbers that you're interested in and why? I mean, it comes back to your first question. We need to get quantitative in ecology. And I think we're, we're, it's moving in that direction in a really good way with all the new tools and the ideas that people are coming up with. But when we get quantitative, we now start to see how ecosystems fit into the bigger picture. You know, you, you asked, why should we care about these ecosystems? Now we can start to quantify what a contribution they have to the global carbon budget. We start to see, oh my God, you're right. Tipping an ecosystem in favor of absorbing carbon rather than, rather than emitting carbon means that we've got a really powerful and tangible climate change solution. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the focus of, of, of quantifying things. We want to understand the abundances of things. So that's your, your three trillion trees. But then we also want to quantify how much carbon is in those is in those things and how much water is in those things. Yeah. And once we start to get a handle on the carbon and the water cycle, we then start to be un able to understand, you know, tangibly how these ecosystems influence the climate. And I think you were able to, one, one tangible effort of that was to, to guide these restoration efforts. So with your work, it went from the plant for the planet, went from a billion tree campaign to a trillion tree campaign. So you were able to get that, that factor of three increase in the, in the sort of, uh, the uh, the horizon that these people were aiming for because you've got this more quantitative understanding of the, the gains that are possible in this area. So that's a, an immediate positive of, of getting more quantitative data. So getting into the nitty gritty of it, because I'm a, a physicist, how do we get these numbers? So we talk about there's three trillion trees. Traditionally, I think you get a satellite, you look down, there's some green stuff there, What's the rough amount of trees that are in a certain square? And then you just times it up and you see how many trees there are. How, how did you go from the initial estimate of 400 billion to get 3 trillion? What is the extra data? What's the, what's the state of the art in this field? I mean, honestly, you, 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 I feel like you're 50% of the way there. You're right. You, <laughs> if we know how much green there is and we know on average how, much tree, how many trees there are in a bit of green, mm. you're halfway there. You can, you can multiply them up and, and get better. But... Obviously, as we know, ecosystems vary massively around the world. So green here doesn't mean the same as green yeah. there. So what we do, instead of just estimating what an average, what the average number of trees in a bit of green is, is we collect data from millions of locations around the world. And so when we've got those millions of, loca uh, you know, data from millions of locations, we then pair that up with all the environmental data. So we've now got wet sites and dry sites yeah. and heights with high, sites with high pH so, and so low pH. So it's going into greater detail and, and, and characterizing those sites. Exactly. More, more specifically. Yeah. And then you can build machine learning models that allow you to see the patterns. You can you sort of fill in the gaps just the same way that Amazon knows what you want to buy next. We can say, right, if it's this wet and this much pH and this 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 temperature yeah. this is what we tend to see for the number of trees and then you match that up with satellite observations and just check that there are trees there and <laughs> yeah, that's and always going to be uh, a little bit disappointing <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah exactly um but it is really it's that combination of you know massive ground source data that enables us to really build robust models mm. that gets us that quantitative step up yeah so, so moving into sort of policy and positive steps forward, because you like to have sort of a positive, uh, you know, message on this channel rather than just being, being worried about all the things that are going to happen to us. So in the context of ecosystems ecology, what do you think are the most effective ways of offsetting the impacts of climate change? What are the most, what can we get out the most bang for our buck? And, and what are the solutions that are going to be able to get this broad based consensus and broad-based support that, that kind of transcends those traditional um, political divides? Good question again. I like it. The, <laughs> I mean, simply put, the biggest pool, the biggest pool of carbon that we are easily able to manage is soil. Like that is, there's about 1500 gigatons of carbon in the, in the world's soil and we manage most of it. So we can have a massive impact through holistic management of soils and and amendments of soils and and honestly in many cases it's just like having a cover crop yeah. over over that pasture when when it's not being used or maintaining vegetation on that soil so i think soils the the core of it all but the easiest way to manage those soils and all those ecosystems is 
the plants. And in when we talk about the plants, we've got forests are a massive carbon store. Uh, peatlands and wetlands are massive because they actually trap loads of carbon in the soil. Mm. So I would say forests, wetlands and peatlands are, are, are massive, you know, potential for carbon sequestration. But that absolutely doesn't underscore the importance of grasslands and, and, um, and, and shrublands around the world, which also have huge amounts of carbon. But to bring it all together... I think restoration of those ecosystems is going to be great. It's going to be led by, you know, massive movements of people. And, and we're actually seeing that already since we're an, uh, announcing these these big numbers. We're seeing massive surges in funding for restoration and mm. projects around the world. But I actually think agroforestry is going to th- be the biggest one because what we're finding is in is that, most... Is that, is that planti- planting trees, is that? Sorry, just to just to define that for the... Yeah, it's, 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 it's using trees in agricultural settings. Yeah. So in most situations we find, so we, we just completed a big analysis in Western Africa where we find that cocoa plantations, you know, all have variations in productivity and the amount of cocoa they're producing. But when you've got about 30 to 40 percent tree cover, uh, so as in shade trees, natural, bio, you know, diverse trees restored in your cocoa plantation, you get the maximum or the optimum yield. Mm. So here, actually having those trees, shading the cocoa plants, trapping water, revitalizing the system actually makes your agriculture better. And we're finding that actually tends to be the case for most agricultural systems. So now it's easy to incentivize because farmers get an actual, you know, economic benefit from it. And it's got the potential for massive increase in carbon uptake. So I think agroforestry is going to be a really cool one. And, you know, we have agriculture over 75% of the land surface. If we can get agroforestry across all of that, we'd be flying. These are, these are always the best solutions I find because, you know, obviously I'm not an expert in this field, but if you can incentivize it with an impact that you can see now, rather than an impact that you're trying to tell people is coming down the pipe, you can, you can get that uptake here and now and say, look, the benefit for you is this, it's going to cost you this, but in five years, you're going to save this and it's going to be better for your your plants and your health and whatever it might be. So I think that's a, a really positive. And I guess the protecting the soil and the and the agroforestry go hand in hand, right? Because you have that, that treetop cover, you don't have that raindrop impact on the soil, you don't get soil being washed away. So it all sort of uh, ties in together. Um, no, exactly. And honestly, the, the real benefit of those agroforestry systems is the carbon in the soil. Yeah, it, for me, it's all about how do we maximize the carbon being trapped in the soil. Yeah. But yeah, forests and, and agroforestry is one of the best ways to do that. And I think uh, looking at one of the, the keynote addresses you gave in October 2018, um, <coughs> the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, yeah. um, you said that there's room for an, ad- an additional 1.2 trillion trees. So there's there's plenty of room for people to to push on this. There's not really a, well, there is an upper ceiling, but there's a, it's a high upper ceiling. There's plenty of plenty of work we can do towards that. Massive, and honestly, at the moment, we're still in a declining trend. We're still seeing more deforestation than restoration. So, you know, the, with with the surge of energy that's seemingly starting to happen this year and last year. I'm hoping to see that tip in favor of more restoration of ecosystems than we're losing. And then, I, I mean, there's huge amounts of, of trees being pledged by massive companies and governments all around the world. And any one of us can easily get involved by just, you know, yeah. donating some money or planting some trees ourselves and get engaged in this massive movement. I was going to say it, it, in the UK for the last election, every single uh, yeah. party was was uh, pledging to plant trees. And for, for kind of a week there, there was just this sort of, well, we'll do 10 million more. No, we'll do 10 million. We'll do 10. And I thought that was really positive because they're essentially trying to outbid themselves to do something that's helpful for the climate, which is great. And and clearly there's there's a there's a will out there and support for it because every single party across the board is able to pledge that. So, you know, it's a very positive and uh and well thought of way of going forward. Um talking in a little bit more specificity about the tree planting, because as you said, it's it's something everyone can get involved with. It's got broad-based support. What other variables impact on that? So I'm thinking you couldn't just have an island where you put all the trees, this 1.2 trillion trees, and then you're done. Um, are we talking about the geography of where you put them, the nature of the trees, the species, fast growing, the size, their support for fungi growth, as we talked about? What is the what is the best way to go about planting trees? I know that sounds stupid in a way, a silly question yeah. maybe, but... Yeah, you're asking me to summarize in a sentence my entire job. It's, <laughs> it's the hardest thing if, ever. If, on a, on if, you, a, if you could. If you could. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a go. 
Um, no, in all honesty, you, you actually say, you know, this is this is a nice bipartisan mm. solution that everyone can get behind. And it is true, you know, uh, when when it, all all those political parties in the UK were actually citing that paper that we did last year saying, you know, we're going to restore more trees. And it was funny for, on social media when a when a when I've a even, well, I've even seen YouTube videos of like, you know, influencers going, I'm going out and planting trees today. We've planted 100 trees. And I'm like, that's brilliant. Yeah. If you can get these these sort of, you know, uh, pop culture figures involved with it as well all the better like it yeah, yeah. becomes a cool you know virtue signaling thing to do and you can harness that as well that's that's all the better you guys spammed me to plant 20 million trees on twitter reddit all over my comment section so i made it happen today we will be planting 20 million trees and we put them in the hole now we need mulch put the mulch around the tree and we hydrate it and there we go yeah Exactly. It's starting to happen and it's awesome. But with anything as powerful as this, and I am saying this is a powerful system we're managing, there's massive dangers. It's not as simple as bang a tree anywhere you want. It does have to be the right endemic species of trees. It's got to be the right diversity of trees. Monocultures of trees are no better than a monoculture of, of wheat. Like we need full mixtures of trees. And most what, importantly, what, why is, that? is that resistance to disease or... It's resistance to disease and, and fires and, and droughts and things like that. It's also for, for your carbon accumulation and the sustainability of the system. A, a system which is one dominated by one, uh, one type of crop or one type of plant, not only are they competing, competing with themselves for the same resources and nutrients, so they'll sort of outcompete each other and, and grow really weak. Yeah. Um, but you also then don't have that resilience. So something changes and they all die. Yeah. We need it to be natural, diverse systems. There's a reason that all the yeah. natural ecosystems on the planet are diverse and we absolutely need that to be replicated so that's really key but it's also not restoring trees where trees aren't wanted mm. huge areas of the world should be natural diverse grasslands which are also massive for carbon storage in the soil mm. and for biodiversity so it's identifying those areas that should res have mm. trees and shouldn't and that's i think why the research gained a lot of attention is we we tried to highlight the regions that should be yeah. available for forest restoration and which ones absolutely should not Good. So, so there's more to it than just, as you say, going outside and banging a tree somewhere. There's a little bit more structure. What, what are the sort of fast growing trees that, that are very useful? Well, actually, that's a good question. That's one where I'm going to I'm going to disagree with you a little bit because okay. it's not fast growing that I particularly care about. I want a native and diverse mixture. Yes. And, and, and if that native mixture is a mixture of slow growing species, mm. that's the one you're going to get the long term healthy carbon storage in, which is supporting the most biodiversity and providing natural ecosystem services. Yeah. W what a lot of times does happen is people replace the natural system with some fast growing trees. Yeah. Yeah. Fast growing doesn't mean you just because you accumulate your bank account faster doesn't mean you get more money in it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like we, we want a naturally uh sort of um a naturally growing system good excellent so we could, we're not just banging bamboo up everywhere and and having done basically exactly. we need to think about a bit more carefully. i mean eucalyptus is a really commonly used one across huge areas of the world and that is a perfect example of you know when, when you bring in an invasive eucalyptus it grows really fast really quick mm. but then they're also extremely prone to fires and fires can decimate the entire ecosystem really quickly so yeah, yeah getting the right mixture of species is key excellent so um, talking about more, things more on, maybe if we go from a, a governmental level then to a sort of community level and a, and a personal level to finish off, what would you like to see from governments? What's the, the biggest bang for your buck that you could get? Would it be this, this agroforestry, do you think? I'd like to see... Uh, climate change is too big for us to be sort of squabbling over solutions. Yeah. We kind of need investment in all of it. And I think the more actively they can promote natural ecosystem regeneration, the better. And that includes the, you know, incentivizing agroforestry. I think that would be huge. But they can also incentivize the regeneration of natural ecosystems through loads of systems, through simply by, you know, the bond challenge is an opportunity where yeah. you can... You, you can gain funding for rest restoring certain ecosystems and that can benefit your government, but but also investing in things like a, a, a universal carbon credit. Yeah. Many people say that's not really possible, but if that if that could be implemented, that people could be restoring trees on their ecosystems and then and then being rewarded for the carbon credits that they're absorbing, that can be massive if it starts to work, yeah. uh, particularly at a large scale. So I I think just being responsive to this bubbling of energy that 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 
the human population is is displaying at the moment and trying to find as many solutions to incentivize yeah. action on the ground I, I, yeah just government engagement will be huge so so one thing i enjoyed seeing on your on your website going to, down to a sort of community level was this um climathon cities award um so it was uh giving money to cities or allowing cities to to sort of compete to come up with the best ways of you know, uh, providing clean energy, you know, uh, clean air, reducing waste. And they bring forward these solutions and then uh, they can essentially compete for funding and specialist support to help bring these uh, these things to fruition. And it, it reminded me of, I don't know if you, well, I'm sure you recently saw the, the Earthshot or was it the Earthshot prize that Prince William was pushing, which was along a similar line. Um, I really like these because they're, they're aimed towards action. And I think there's two really big things that help with it. It's actual practical solutions, which moves people away from the sort of catastrophizing. And as you said, it helps this bubbling energy. You're like, well, you can do something. There's something you can do. So let's get on with it. And also it harnesses that sort of, uh, it sounds a bit dirty to say, but that virtue signaling, look, we're doing something. You know, I want people to see that I'm doing something. We want our city to be the, the cleanest in the world. And if you can harness that, I think it's really useful. Um, why did this award focus on, on on cities? It sounds like a silly uh, a silly question because obviously they're a, they're a huge centre of CO two emissions. But why why particularly cities? What are the, what are the challenges for cities that we're going to see over the next sort of fifty years or so? Yeah. So I mean, you, you're totally right. I, just to sort of touch on on what you were saying there, I I personally think sort of the negativity and the, and the climate guilt mm. is partially responsible for our lack of action you know when when you're when, when we're re relentlessly depressed about how terrifying <laughs> climate change is it breeds in action yeah. but when you have tangible ways to get involved however small you know eight billion eight billion of us doing small things makes a big number and it and i think the the nice thing about being able to get engaged in one of these solutions like planting a tree or you know helping out with some grassland stuff or whatever it is you then not only do you do you feel good about that and then you start recycling more and then you feel good about that too and then you eat a little bit, little bit less meat and and you really get engaged I sh and i guess i should have mentioned re re reduced meat consumption can definitely be a useful way that governments can get involved from a top down level but anyway the to answer your question i, I love meat by the way i'm trying i, 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 know, I am trying i am trying i promise honestly a, cut down one meal a week then yeah, yeah. I, I that's what i do i feel like i, I eat meat too yeah. i don't eat very much of it yeah. but I always feel like, you know, it doesn't require that everybody absolutely changes their life entirely. Yeah. But with every meal you cut down, you're contributing a, a, a little chunk and then cut two, two a week and then three a week and you start getting better and better. And I had a couple of vegan burgers last night. They weren't actually too bad. So I might I might throw those in. Right. You know, they're getting they're better. Like, yeah, they're getting yeah, better yeah, all the they time. Are, they are getting better. They are they're getting the future. Um, but uh, to come back to your actual question, cities, yeah the majority of the human population lives in them. And by 2050, I think it's estimated that about 75% of people are going to be living in cities. Mm. So when we talk about climate change and the impact on human societies, cities are, the, are, are a perfect indicator. They're like a, a you know, they're, they're a perfect place to start. Yeah. And not, not only that, they're also affected most by, by the warming temperatures around the yeah. world. So you get these heat islands that happen in cities because there's no, there's fewer trees. There's a lot of reflection of the sun's energy and, and a, a lot of heat gets trapped in city systems. They can be a massive impact on human health and well-being. Mm. So not only is it worthwhile getting engaged in, you know, getting, getting the cities engaged in climate mitigation for, for the global climate yeah, contributions, but it's literally it's it's got tangible impacts on human health within yeah. that city so it's it's like a it sort of it touches so the global and yeah. the local level yeah no that's 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 really interesting and i really like these prizes again so, so if you look at a lot of people will say look are these prizes really going to get people on board who wouldn't have got on board anyway but then and i and i thought that but then i look at things like like kaggle these coding challenges and people come you know by the hundreds by the thousands to just solve problems for the for the benefit of saying I solved a problem or a little bit of uh, you know uh, media coverage or social media coverage, they get a chance to say that I made uh, an impact on this. So you get an awful lot of work without actually paying people to do a lot of work, which in some ways sounds bad, but it's also a very cost-effective way to 
to to take advantage of you as you said of that that bubbling energy underneath and people want to do something so you don't have to pay you know a thousand postdocs but you get a thousand people working on on these problems so it's uh an incredibly cost effective and and hopefully potentially uh you know useful way of of putting people's energy into practice no you're exactly right it's it's totally that i mean the we all want to say that we're contributing and every, and that includes cities want to say they're contributing and definitely being, you know, being one of the finalists or being awarded the the international leader on climate change, or, you know, in leading city on climate change is going to be a massive thing, not only for for their PR, but also it'll, it will engage more more people from that city. You get you get a little sense of pride of it about it. And then suddenly all the people in that city start to improve. And and I do think these competitions tend to like yeah. increase people's engagement in those kind of activities. Yeah, it's 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 awesome. We usually like downplay the 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 benefit of, of competition, you know, people, you know, downplaying capitalism, this sort of thing. But maybe that competition is actually what's going to, you know, really engage people to, you know, we've got one up on your city, you know, our city is the greatest place to live in the world or whatever it might be, might actually be a useful way of, uh, of going about these things. Um, yeah, we'll see. So uh, final finish, I guess, bring it down to the individual level. Um, you had another Climathon Citizens Award, I guess, which is now closed. Um, we talked about these things, I guess, in, in, in passing going through, but if I'm an individual... I guess just just say it to me and I, I want to do something um, you know I don't have the greatest amount of time outside of work and this kind of thing to get involved and do things what would be the best way for me as an individual to spend my time to have a positive impact on climate change in your opinion right I mean I'm not going to give one I'm going to give loads but good no that's what I want because <laughs> <laughs> yeah because climate again it's all climate actions about doing everything we can but yeah. I mean the the easy ones are saying things like, you know, manage your energy use and and your meat consumption. Of of course, trying to live more sustainably sustainably is always going to be the key to to reduce emissions. That's awesome. But the nice thing is, you can also take positive sort of yeah positive actions rather than just avo- avoiding things that you might so, like. So, so um, just just drawing back one second there with the meat consumption because people talk about this a lot. Um, where are the where are the carbon emissions coming with the meat consumption? Is it the moving the animals around is it is it cows farting as a lot of people like to talk about where where are the main the main drivers of the carbon in in that industry i don't talk so much about the cows farting <laughs> i mean they they do but you know massive herds have been farting for a long time but the we yes it's it's you have to remove you have to remove entire ecosystems to be able to um rear those rear the, primarily beef is the main the main so, so we've got the sort of slash and burn that goes on in brazil and, and this type of thing a lot of that but then you also need to feed them and for that you cut down even more rainfor- yeah. rainforest you actually need more space to feed the cattle than you need to grow them yeah so that's another contributor of course the emissions throughout the entire agricultural process are massive and yeah transporting them around is huge so it's like the whole system is just you know ripe for sort of in, in, in inefficient use of resources um so we need we need those meat substitutes to taste as good as beef as soon as possible basically this is exactly they're on the way and if the government can incentivize that that'd be awesome i've spoken to some really amazing scientists doing you know um lab culture beef the purity of the of the of the cultures are getting better and better and better it's i i'm sure very soon they're going to be really widespread and amazing so um yeah i think that's awesome but there's also yeah that in terms of the ecological side and if you want to get engaged we always say there's sort of three simple three simple ways is get involved yourself if you really want to get green you know go and protect a rainforest or or more often and more often than not in the northern hemisphere it's you know go plant a tree or get involved in a restoration project or something so, which can so i guess there, i guess there are plenty of these on the local level that people can google for and um, massive numbers that you wouldn't know about and it's not just trees it's wetlands and peatlands and all sorts of stuff but but if you go on our website you can see you know we've got maps where there's dots all over the place where you yeah. can easily link up with them and, and connect um the other one is related to that just donate to them it's it's yeah. as simple as that they yeah. they all need funding to keep functioning they all need functioning to uh, sorry funding to, <laughs> to keep rear the right trees and get it all right so you know easy donate ten dollars will go towards a certain number of trees and you feel good about yourself yeah at, or, or at the sort of lowest level of involvement, genuinely figuring out how we spend our investments, whether it's the things we buy or your actual, you know, financial investments. Preferentially, and there are now a lot of uh, a lot of services that are help you to do this, mm. but preferentially selecting organisations that have a positive environmental impact. Yeah. 
force those organizations and force the other organizations to comply yeah. and start becoming more yeah. environmentally aware or socially aware. And it has a massive, massive yeah. impact. I think I think there's definitely a more ground up approach that people can take rather than saying, oh, the government has to do it for me and I'm not going to do anything until the government does it to everyone else. It's like, you know, take it into your own hands and, and put pressure on these as a as a group of people who are worried about these things. Yeah. Um, you know, as a community and a, and a large group of people with with power, political power. Totally, I, I believe I'm I'm an absolute believer of the bottom up. It's always going to be driven by us. Yeah. It's going to be driven by us doing actions and and investing in things right and 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 voting for 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 people that we think will shape the shape uh, sustainable systems a little bit better. So, like governments and companies are only going to respond if we all yeah. shape the market in that way. So I think we can all have a massive impact just by being mindful of that. What what do you think are the big things that have stopped people? taking particular action on this is is it the fact that this is a a sort of you know rumbling heart attack that might come along in 50 years and people don't really feel the impacts in their everyday life is is it that psychological thing or is it misinformation or is it the catastrophization and then maybe those catastrophes don't come true on a on a short or short term basis what what do you think has been the the cause uh, I, of inactivity you know sort of since the 70s 80s and and going forward I I think it's really hard for us to imagine things that are not happening within our very immediate future and location. So, you know, the, the biggest impacts of climate change may not be happening right in my garden right yeah. now. Yeah. But there are long to a long slow burn, and I think th th uh, better technology and, our, and improving our models and ability to predict climate change to an out not just to predict it, but to allow people to visualize the changes. We, we had a paper last year that showed, you know, what every city in the world, what their climate would be most like. Like I think, for example, London was most like Barcelona, which sounds lovely until you realize that Barcelona's had five years of yeah. really severe droughts, yeah. and you need massive infrastructural change just to be able to yeah. to, to handle those droughts and stuff. Yeah. I think being able to visualize a climate future is 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 necessary to sort of, sort of to sort of inspire mass action. And I think with the extreme you know extreme climatic events we've been seeing in the last couple of years, that might have spurred on a bit of uh, people's engagement. But the other thing is, as you mentioned, miscommunication has been horrendous, incentivized by certain different groups of people. Yeah. But the the intentional miscommunication has absolutely drag the rug from under a lot of the, the climate change movement and it's so good now it seems to be that the 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 science is overwhelming the yeah the nonsense this is I, i'm just going to go out and say it and i don't mean this in a sycophantic way but i'd much rather have you on the tv explaining it and saying look these are the quantitative effects these are the benefits this is where we can get the most bang for our buck these are the things that everyone will support let's do it then hear the sort of catastrophizing and you know we're all going to be dead in 12 years because yeah. my worry with that is not that i don't understand the importance of what these people are doing and i don't i don't see that they're scared and they're trying to have a positive impact but i think it gives people who don't want to do anything or are distrustful of the science an easy out because when they when they oversell and then these things don't come to pass they go ah well it's all just rubbish it's all just a socialist land grab and you know, people trying to push their their certain political preferences, you know, using science as a shield or, or using children as, or, you know, think of the children, this type of thing. Whereas if we keep it on the science and then you, you start to see the predictions of the science are coming true in Australia, look what's going on. You can see this was predicted. We said this on, you know, Tuesday, the 7th of, you know, October 2018, and now it's happened. Um I think that will help to overwhelm that as well as presenting as you do viable solutions and positive ways of moving forward because people feel far more, I just think people are far more incentivized by the positive message than they are by sort of being lectured about how terrible they are and particularly when they have hard lives themselves. They're like, ah, oh, sod this, I don't want to hear about how, how terrible a person I am and how I can't eat meat and this. It, it just, I think in the current political atmosphere where people particularly in the uk there's a feeling that they've been lectured at and you know elites are telling them what to do i think we need to incentivize people with more of a positive message i'm not saying that all those messages about about people sort of lecturing down to you are true but i think there's there's a more tactful way to go about it at the moment to get people on side to 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 just have a positive message and get get people moving forward 
I mean, yeah, there's a there's a lot of debate about this actually, but I am overwhelmingly in the same in the same camp as you. I I I always feel bad because I'm having a go at people who are trying to to have a positive benefit, but I, I just don't I don't see what impact and positive movement forward they they're getting. So we need to try something a little bit different. Well, I think they do a good job of calling out yeah. systems that are failing yeah. but i don't think it works on the individual level i don't think it's worth saying you at home you've caused this yeah. it's now it's now more far it's the worst thing ever it's more it's so far gone you can't do anything about it yeah. and yet you should still give up all the things you like <laughs> yeah. to do it you're like well, well it's like know. why don't i just keep them if i'm going to be dead in 12 years like let's have yeah. a big party you know so. exactly i'll bail yeah. <laughs> yeah um so yeah i totally don't agree with that i do think that that sort of um the i don't know what, what well, it brings, better it, it brings, it, it brings it up the the political yeah you know, it's, br agenda. it's brought it to the forefront but now we need the solutions that sort of go behind that exactly you know we, yeah. there's been a it's clearly every day on the bbc i see another thing about climate change you know brilliant i'm glad people are talking about it i'm glad people know that it's a big issue but then we need to as you say something needs to come behind that to say okay and we can do something about it and you don't have to do much. And actually, it probably won't cost you much of your time or your money. Here's what you can do. Just let's do a little bit all together. And, uh, you know, people will stop screaming. <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, I think that's it. We need, I think the negativity is necessary to, you know, to call out systems that are failing. Yeah. But when it comes down to enabling people, we need that positive message about solutions and how they can get involved. And it's starting to work, I think. Brilliant. I think that's a, a really nice place to, to stop and rack, uh, um, wrap up. Uh, Professor Crowther, thank you very much for talking to us. I really appreciate it. And hopefully uh, when there's another topic that's relevant, we can uh, we can do it again. Nice. Yeah, it was great chatting. Really good questions. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, really good, uh, clear and uh, detailed answers. And I've learned a lot. So I'm, I'm cool. happy as well. Thank you very nice much. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you very much. Bye. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'll catch you soon. Bye. See you later. Bye.